Um, I am uh, Lucy Delap. I'm a historian based at uh, the, the History Faculty in Cambridge and Murray Edwards College. Um, I am uh, going to be talking today about gender justice in an international and global uh, framework. I'll just give my, uh, my apologies for the absence of our, um, our chair. We actually had two chairs lined up and both have had to, uh, to withdraw at the last minute. So uh, Catherine, Arnold and myself are going to be self-chairing. Uh, and I hope you'll, you'll, you'll forgive us for any, uh, any wobbles in the course of the seminar. So um, just to say a couple of words about my own uh, research interests, which can help frame our conversation today. I am very much a historian of, uh, of modern Britain, but modern Britain understood in its, uh, its global, uh, its uh, Anglo-American and its colonial um, contexts. Um, and my research has kind of ranged across um, uh, thinking about uh, the history of feminism in an Anglo-American perspective, in a colonial perspective, and then most recently in a, uh, a global perspective. Uh, my recent book on, on um, feminism's a global history um, prompted really the opportunity for this conversation on um, gender justice in, in, its, in its global context. And I'm really thrilled to be in conversation today with Catherine Arnold. And Catherine has asked me to, uh, to not bother with the, uh, the, the distinguished uh, work history, but I am going to give it nonetheless, because um, it's really uh, an honor to be in dialogue with somebody who has been uh, working at the, at the front line, really, of thinking about how the global operates and how uh, international and national uh, politics uh, play out. She is uh, currently the master of St. Edmund's College, um, and we wave to each other over the, 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 the hedge between our two colleges. Um, but before coming to Cambridge, she worked at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and she was, uh, until 2018, the ambassador to Mongolia, uh, and was awarded an OBE in 2019 for her services to British foreign policy, and she's got interests that, that span human rights and uh, trade and a whole range of the, um, the, the issues that, that, uh, that diplomats engage in. Uh, it's really fantastic to have Catherine here and to be setting historical content into dialogue with uh, the contemporary and, and looking forward to uh, the future for gender justice. So welcome, Catherine. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, gender justice. Um, we're going to talk about figures who commonly um, called themselves or sometimes called themselves feminists, but also used other labels, talked about the women's movement um, or other ways of um, framing their politics. And in particular, we're going to try and draw out how their activism worked across borders. Some of them were aligned with global movements such as socialism or the abolition of slavery. Some of them worked within national contexts and struggles such as the suffrage campaign, but they also understood how international collaboration could try to advance those national uh, uh, campaigns. Some of them saw feminism as a global struggle in its own right, without the need to hitch it to any other kind of politics. But how they understood what the global might mean varied very strongly over time. So today is a chance to, to, to look at some of those, that, that variability of the global, if you like, and to place it in, in, into dialogue with ongoing campaigning. And I want to preface my talk today with a um, immediate pitch that we might think about feminisms in the plural. So why is that important? I'd argue that we can see struggles that look recognizably like uh, something that we would uh, uh, frame as, as feminist over the past 250 years, even if that um, takes us into terrain that's well before when the term feminist was coined in the late 19th century. So I'd include in that kind of 250 year span campaigns for child custody, for land rights, for girls and women's education, for the freedom to vote, to work, or to enter politics. And, and those things stretch back to the late 18th century. But it's not surprising that over that long period, there's been many different versions of what uh, goals might matter uh, to, to, to women. Some have stressed uh, sexual freedoms, Others have preferred to think about anti-poverty or women's spiritual leadership. Some think that women are naturally peace-loving. Others have stressed the right to bear arms and have used militant or violent methods. Feminists of the past are sometimes looked back to as foremothers. That's a very familiar um, uh, thing for perhaps all of us. But when we look back to those uh, activists of the past, it's very unusual to find that they fully align with goals that we might think of as feminists today. It's a movement that claims half of humanity or more as its 
uh, its, its own. So it's perhaps not surprising that there are many different goals that can't be really boiled down into some simple statement about what feminism means, even though whenever I give talks on the history of feminism, I normally get at least one question from the audience saying, just tell me what it is. <laughs> so people want that kind of, um, uh, you know, starter for 10 version of what feminism is, but I prefer to use the language of um, feminisms because I think that allows us to bring new kinds of actors into our story and to include those who are organizing under um, the name of social justice, perhaps, or religious mission or national liberation. Now, I want to take us to perhaps one of the best known places for thinking about feminism as internationalism. And that is to the landmark UN conferences that were held between 1975 and 1995, which culminated in the famous Beijing Declaration made at the 1995 uh, UN Conference on Women, which declared that, quote, the full implementation of the human rights of women and of the girl child is, in, is an inalienable, integral and indivisible part of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. So that was a very important moment in 95 of the mainstreaming of uh, women's rights, often associated with the work of Hillary Clinton, who was first lady at that point, and who made a speech under the, um, the title, Women's Rights Are Human Rights. So feminist concerns gained the gravity and the protection of being incorporated into the human rights discourse as the latter became for, for a period, um, the lingua franca of global affairs. And Hillary Clinton received credit for having articulated this position within China, not normally known for its human rights commitments, and also as a first lady, which is a role, of course, more commonly con connected with kind of smart outfits and being a, a supporting act. But to take that as an achievement of the 1990s or of Clinton herself is to seriously foreshorten our gaze and also to remove a sense of the conflicts and struggles that accompanied the entry of gender and gender justice into that terrain of internationalism and diplomacy. It's important, I think, not to take at face value the idea that white uh, and privileged uh, Europeans or uh, Americans have been the originators of important feminist interventions. So today I want to take us to some other sites that give us that longer history, uh, as well as a more varied account of how feminist influences might be brought to bear in geopolitics. Now, of course, when I was thinking about this talk, I was very tempted by many possible areas where we could dive in and um, understand better that larger story. I, I would have loved to have talked about temperance in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, or women's role in the international abolitionist movement. But given the time frame that we've got, I thought I would just take us to two points in time and use those two points to think about some different casts of characters. So the first moment in time is 1919. And that was an extraordinary moment of internationalist hope and activity, represented in particular by a series of conferences in that year. Particularly, of course, our attention centers on the Paris Peace Conference, the peace negotiations, which were informed by uh, American President Woodrow Wilson's commitment to the rights of small nations and to self-determination. And he, he accompanied that with a commitment to women's suffrage. Although like Hillary Clinton, I don't think uh, Wilson can be seen as the originator of um, those projects which had been discussed around the world and, and, and certainly well beyond the kind of Euro-American uh, big players at the Paris Peace Conference. So 1919 seemed like a real moment of opportunity for feminists as well as for those under um, other um, uh, forms of, of, of politics, uh, not just to gain uh, the vote for, um, for, for new constituents of women voters, but also for lots of their other concerns, disarmament, for example, uh, action against sex trafficking, wage equality, maternity rights and benefits, and the creation in particular of a global um, internationalist uh, um, governance system that would hopefully replace warmongering in the future. For the activists at the time, many of them were looking less to Woodrow Wilson and more uh, back to the, uh, the peace conference that had been held in The Hague um, uh, by women opposed to um, World War I in 1915. And at that conference, which was uh, very uniquely for a wartime conference attended by women from, from both sides of the, um, the, the conflict, 
a new organization had been created titled the International Women's Committee of Permanent Peace. In 1919, that organization's name was headed, was changed to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And that, uh, that body still uh, continues today to oppose uh, fighting wars, to amplify feminist voices, and to seek both social and gender justice. And it's a good example of a kind of feminist intervention, 100 years old now, deliberately global, and seeking goals that wouldn't have been out of keeping really with the 1995 rhetoric that no progress could be made in solving world problems if women's rights and gender justice were always seen as peripheral issues. Now, the women who were involved in the, um, the 1919 uh, peace conference were pretty disappointed because they weren't in fact given the opportunity to join. And despite Wilson's encouraging noises, the actual negotiations didn't really see gender justice as important. Requests for a women's commission to be part of the, um, uh, the, the, the peace negotiations were rejected, as were calls for action on sex trafficking and married women's citizenship. In 1919, activists turned instead to a range of other high profile events, such as the Inter-Allied Women's Conference, the International Conference of Working Mothers, and the Maternity Protection Convention. All these uh, myriad of different um, uh, 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 forums and platforms in that very packed and very hopeful year of 1919. But they did manage to gain an important concession regarding the operations of the League of Nations, that its staff would be mixed sex and that all roles could be taken on by women on equal terms to men. Now that was very important in creating a kind of pipeline of women who were well versed in international diplomacy, even when most national diplomatic services were still refusing to employ women on equal terms to men. It also ensured that women would be part of the creation of the United Nations after World War II and would help support the efforts to build gender justice into that organization. So what kind of feminist ideologies were informing uh, these efforts in 1919? Well, we can see some that perhaps chime with us today, others which may be less familiar. We can see, for example, a very strong element of pronatalism uh, amongst some, believing that women gave their most important service as mothers and so deserved rights of um, uh, civic recognition and, and political participation. And that was actually an appeal that Woodrow Wilson very firmly supported, believing that mothers had suffered unspeakable losses of sons during World War I and that that needed to be recognized. So that they had quite a lot of leverage with that um, idea of uh, maternalism. Others downplayed maternalism and preferred to stress that women had a role to play as workers. And this was of course prominent in early Soviet uh, policy. Alexandra Kollontai was the uh, Soviet Union's first um, uh, delegate to the League of Nations General Assembly. Uh, and became one of the world's first female ambassadors. And she stressed women's rights to contraception, to abortion, and their fulfillment through labor in all fields. And we can see that same commitment in the, um, the pleas for uh, women to have the right to enter all forms of labor, uh, articulated by the South African feminist, Olive Schreiner. And you know, going back a little bit into the 19th century in Margaret Fuller's wonderful utopian uh, declaration in 1843, let them be sea captains, if you will, uh, the idea of women as, as, as uh, really spreading into all fields. So I mean, the, both those, those um, uh, lineages, maternalism and a sort of workerism approach, um, I think were, were very long, long lived in the women's movement. But perhaps most distinctive in 1919 was the commitment to liberal versions of liberal internationalism the rule of international law underpinned by trade and the hopes pinned to international treaties to secure change. I think it's also important for us to recognize that the uh, feminist ideologies that underpinned the creation of bodies such as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in 1919 were rooted on understandings of race and civilization that prioritized Euro-American leadership and typically saw women of the global south as victimized by men of their own communities. And this has been a, a strand that has rightly been really foregrounded in recent feminist uh, histories, talking about Orientalism, about um, imperialism, about racism by scholars such as Antoinette Burton, Karen Offen, and many others. And I think that is characteristic of the, the scholarship really of the, 
the 1990s and the 2000s, very firmly focused both on internationalism and transnationalism as modes of feminist operation, but also about writing the histories of racism into that and recognizing the ideas of white or Western or Christian superior, superiority that come out again and again. And perhaps that legacy uh, of racism and, and, and civilizational thinking has helped explain why so many women of color have been very reluctant to, to embrace that feminist past or call themselves feminist. There were no representatives from beyond Europe and the US at many of the big conferences in 1919. And it's only really been in the last 10 years that the historiography has expanded to recognize the activity and the agency of women of the global south. Women who have often picked alternative, alternative terms, such as Alice Walker coining the term womanist in 1979 as an alternative to feminist. And we get into our feminist stories, um, uh, women who've been organizing under these other agendas, such as anti-colonialism, for example, even though gender has often been a very important part of those struggles. Mona Siegel's recent book, uh, Peace on Our Terms, has deliberately um, foregrounded the work of feminists um, uh, in the Pan-African uh, uh, organizing of the day in Egyptian and Chinese uh, nationalism in 1919. And uh, this sits alongside really the stories about um, Women's International um, League of Peace and Freedom, which we need to see, I think, um, as, as provincialized as part of Europe, but not necessarily as um, uh, uh, offering us a globe that, that everyone felt that they had equal access to. We can see this very interestingly in the work of Huda Sharawi, who was a, an Egyptian anti-colonial activist um, and founder of the uh, Egyptian Feminist Union in 1923. Now that moment is very interesting because it was the same year that she participated in one of the big international uh, women's suffrage uh, um, uh, conferences in Rome. And she's famous in a, in a sort of older feminist historiography for having come back from Rome and stepped off the train in Cairo and pulling off her veil, declared herself as um, able to appear in public without the veil. Now that has been very important for some versions of feminist history as a kind of um, um, uh, vindication of the idea that feminists repudiate Islam and its constraints. But in fact, the um, Egyptian Feminist Union looked to Islam as a positive model for supporting women's education, for women's property rights, for their divorce rights, for custody over children. And Shawahi was far from secular in her approach. She went on to found the Arab Feminist Union to support her pan-Arab uh, feminist activism in the 1940s. And again, was very closely meshed with um, uh, the pan-Arab, um, mostly uh, overtly pro-Islam, uh, or, organizing of the 1940s. So she's a good example of how we can get away from feminist histories that center on Europe or center on um, uh, Christian activities and tell instead uh, non-European and non-Christian uh, stories. And I want to support that move by turning to a different cast of characters in a different moment in time uh, uh, now to take us to the work of the Women's International Democratic Federation, the WIDF. My apologies for all these abbreviations, which all start with W and are therefore rather hard to, uh, uh, to, to disentangle. But the WIDF was a, a body that like, like the Women's International um, League for Peace and Freedom was also founded in Paris. But this time in 1945, as a product of the uh, anti-fascist organizing of the, um, the 1940s, but with a very sustained and strong interest in women's rights, uh, in peace and in children's well-being. Now those goals don't seem that far from the kinds of goals that we see in the activists of 1919, but I think the crucial difference relates to the, um, the ideological underpinnings that had shifted from liberal internationalism to a vision of social and economic rights. And that was of course profoundly shaped by the Cold War context which um, uh, shaped the post-war decades and have continued to shape uh, the kinds of histories that come from that period. The WIDF has been uh, relatively understudied by historians until really the last five years or so when there's been a, an avalanche of studies on it. Um, the reason why it's been so neglected is because it was often regarded as a kind of communist front 
uh, communist sponsored a political um, uh, entity, which um, it was assumed was a kind of entryist uh, project, trying to, to get women through their interest in gender justice into the kind of communist or socialist fold. But in fact, the WIDF had a mass membership that stretched across the world. In fact, it was the largest post-war women's uh, uh, organization. And its national affiliates were often very dynamic players in national or regional uh, politics and not just party apparatchniks. And their record of their activism has been recently explored across a really wonderful uh, range of, of countries, Vietnam, Algeria, Brazil, Indonesia. And the alignment with the Soviet bloc didn't prevent, in fact, very extensive work uh, with women's organizations that were aligned with the West, suggesting a degree of fluidity and also multipolarity uh, in the women's movements of this period. It included many non-communist uh, women, although uh, in the United States, the House on American Activities Committee, the kind of McCarthyite uh, group in the 1950s, judged that the, uh, the WIDF was best understood as being about, quote, communist world conquest. So let's have a look at a single individual to understand the kinds of trajectories of um, uh, politics and, and, and activism for feminists who were associated with um, the work of the WIDF. And I want to, to, to talk to, to you about um, a wonderful figure who I, I turn to again and again in trying to think about feminist activism in its, um, in its most inclusive sense in this period. And this is a figure called Funmilayo Ransom Kuti, who was born into a, a relatively wealthy Nigerian family in 1900 and was educated in Nigeria and in the UK. Now, um, Ransom Kuti uh, started her political career working in um, philanthropy with an organization called the, um, uh, the Abeo Kuta Ladies Club, very classic kind of uh, 1940s term which aimed, quote, to raise the standard of womanhood, a kind of top-down female-led project. But Ransom Kuti was more willing to listen to poorer women than most in that Abeo Kuta Ladies Club, uh, particularly in relation to the precarity and the high taxation that they faced for those working as market traders. And she came to dedicate her activism to helping such women, adopting their mode of dress and leading their, their strikes, which she always named picnics to avoid uh, police action in British rural Nigeria in the 1940s. She was particularly incensed by women having to strip naked in order to prove their age and thus their taxable status in an environment where, of course, they didn't have records relating to their um, their births. Um, and so, so, so they were they were being asked to take their clothes off in front of colonial officials um, as a kind of particularly persecuting aspect of the taxation system. And nakedness is an interesting feature of Nigerian political life because it was famously used by women traders in the 1920s to confront the British system of warrant chiefs and protest their rule. There's a very famous episode in, in 1929, which is termed the Women's War in the Nigerian um, historiography, which saw over 10,000 women undertake activities that they, they termed sitting on men which used the kind of collective insult of stripping naked and throwing sand at men. It's an amazing kind of imaginary moment, 10,000 women taking their clothes off and, and, and becoming these un, un, unmanageable figures. It, it ended tragically with the death of 21 of those women as troops opened fire. But it's a, it's a very resonant memory for Nigerian um, uh, women's uh, activists. So Ransom Kuti had that in mind but also her vivid sense of women's economic um, uh, uh, marginalization. And her activism helps us uh, see that the goals we might think of as feminist goals in the uh, global North, such as the right to work or to vote, were supplemented by goals more relevant to women in the global South, such as the rights to land ownership, to literacy uh, and to clean water. And those are feminist goals because women are disproportionately excluded from them. But Ransom Kuti also didn't lose sight of the need for national independence as a feminist goal, which had been in increasingly visible, of course, in 1919, as there was talk of self-determination used to describe both nations and individuals. So therefore relevant to how feminists saw uh, collective and ind individual uh, goals. 
So um, this is a very interesting um, example of how um, uh, feminism can be led from women in the global south. And after Nigerian independence was achieved in 1960, Ransom Kuti became a very prominent women's rights speaker across West Africa and later across the world, often sponsored by the WIDF. Like many feminist activists, she was galvanized by the WIDF stress on, on the particular violences and burdens faced by women under colonial regimes and the solidarity that could take place between uh, colonized and colonizing nations. The WIDF sponsored a series of conferences in the post-war decades, such as the Women of Asia in 1948, and in 1958, the Asian African Conference of Women, and pushed very strongly at the United Nations for women's rights to be understood as human rights. Uh, uh, Funmilaya Ransom Kuti became one of their vice presidents. And it was the WIDF who worked in the UN to declare um, a, a women's year in 1975 and to sponsor those famous conferences, which we mentioned at the beginning and which gave Hillary Clinton her platform. It had also been the WIDF that lobbied for the conventions uh, um, adopted by the UN, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which was adopted in 1979. So the approach of the WIDF in some ways was out of keeping with the kind of state-centric United Nations. Uh, it saw its feminist goals as best achieved by the mobilization of its mass membership. But in some countries, its work could only really be made legible through the state, particularly in those where state socialism had led to the um, sponsorship of, of state feminist bodies, such as in China or Mozambique or Vietnam. In other countries, such as Nigeria, the WIDF promoted a thriving civil society approach, or in Latin America, it promoted indigenous women's organizing. So it's kind of hard to generalize about the impact that it had, but it does, as I said, give us the chance to see these variety of different agendas and to, to weave them into our stories about the kinds of feminist activism that, that, that we can see and to, to, to give a context to the events in the, uh, uh, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, which saw human rights uh, come center stage. So to summarize three very, very brief conclusions, women aren't just present at uh, these moments of intense negotiation and power play around internationalism in 1919 and 1945 were definitely those moments, but they helped to shape that process, that global negotiation um, and global institutions. Um, second, feminist history isn't neutral. It isn't disaligned from the kinds of power play that we see happen at those moments. And the way we write history is often shaped by those ideological views. And we can see that in the kind of the changing concerns that uh, feminists have. And, and finally, um, the racism that we uh, have rightly stressed as part of um, feminist history, I would say yes, but we shouldn't allow that story to outweigh uh, understanding better how women of color and women of the global south have also been part of the story and have provided feminist leadership. So the racism is more a journey than a kind of um, uh, a, a necessary state of affairs in, um, in feminist history. So I'm going to, um, uh, uh, before handing over to Catherine for a response, just quickly remind the audience that you can ask questions. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, box. So perhaps while Catherine gives her response to, to this um, uh, 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 little disquisition that I've offered you, you might all start thinking about questions that you might want to answer. And we will, I hope, have plenty of time to, to, to have some, some exchanges with you. So over to Catherine. Thank you very much indeed, um, Lucy. I'm going to try and sit back, otherwise I'm going to be somewhat tiger-striped. Um, when asked today to give the response um, as a practitioner, I felt incredibly honoured, um, because as a practitioner, there is not the depth and breadth um, of historical understanding that Lucy displays both in this talk that she's given thus far and the book that she's written. So in part, what I thought I'd focus on is what does it actually mean to be a practitioner? The first thing I want to say is that I do hope that everyone here has read Lucy's book. And if you haven't, do. It is a dance through time, culture and space. It settles briefly and then we're whisked on Japan, America, Nigeria, the UK, India, Germany. And as Lucy has said already today, from women breaking through glass ceilings to women protecting traditional roles and spaces, women who died for their beliefs to women who refused physical violence as non-female expression. 
If you're looking for clear answers, then this probably isn't that book. But perhaps my role in today's discussion is to tell you why, as a former diplomat, Lucy's dance through global history is far more powerful for anyone interested in the practical operation of a state than a manual, a pamphlet, or a polemic. And the reason for me is complexity. Being a practitioner of my ilk isn't glamorous. At best, we're the ghostwriters of ideas, but more often, we're simply their servants. Our job is to work out how to deliver them, keep them in order, not create too much disturbance for those not at the party and clear up the mess when they go wrong. That's why Whitehall speak is littered with phrases such as when the rubber hits the road, let's test drive that idea and whether a policy will or won't survive first contact with reality. As practitioners, we neither have the luxury of extensive reflection nor the purity of a singular purpose. And this is why an appreciation of complexity really matters. There was one story in Lucy's book to which I kept returning, that of Pandita Ramabai. Born in 1858 to a Brahmin Sanskrit teacher, she used the rarity at the time of her own education to find found homes that, among other things, focused on women's education. Ramabai's story shows that the, that the moment an idea turns from protest into implementation, complexity, choice, and compromises enter. One leaves her story feeling Ramabai was too Indian for her Western backers, too foreign for her local constituency, and too progressive in her views on religion for almost anyone with the ability to support her financially or politically. And yet the purpose she had in common with many global feminisms, the power of women's education, echoes down the decades and across the continents. It is shared today by organizations around the world, Boris Johnson and the fourth sustainable development goal. But Ramabai shows us the perils even of this notionally shared framework. What education? Whose curriculum? With what expectation? These are all questions in the world of the thoughtful practitioner where outcomes must be achieved with few certainties, many opinions and lots of shades of gray. I want to give you three very different personal reflections. In 2003, I went to Iraq to help set up a newspaper. We tried to form, doubtless naively, a genuine collaboration between the Iraqi and foreign staff to create a dual language paper catering to local and international readers. But security was a problem. I took the decision that if I wanted to tell the stories that matter, get to the places that the foreign press corps couldn't, and not put either myself or my Iraqi colleagues into too much danger, I needed not to stand out. With my hair covered and a suntan, I can pass as an Iraqi, given the rich ethnic diversity of that country. It was a pragmatic decision to help further an objective shared and endorsed by my Iraqi colleagues. Then one day I went for an interview with the head of a secure hospital. It had been mistaken for a prison, and had its walls knocked down in a bout of liberating exuberance. I waited to see if the white-coated man before me would want to shake my hand, given I was a woman. What I hadn't foreseen was the unforgettable verbal dressing down I received. If I, as a foreign woman, wouldn't walk around Baghdad standing up for the right of a woman to show her hair, then there was, he said, no hope that his wife and daughters would ever be able to retain that freedom, which, until recently, they had taken for granted. He would shake my hand when I stood before him as I would at home, showing my hair. For me, that right, and the right for a woman to veil should she wish, was so taken for granted that it had simply become a choice. For him, it was a symbol of a rising tide of intolerance, a freedom being taken from his family. Despite having grown up overseas, it was my first encounter of what it means to be a symbol, to represent, not always through choice, something that is much more than oneself. That the practitioner, no matter how thoughtful, will also always be a projection of others' perceptions, and that that shapes the nature of the interaction. Perception, as they say, informs reality. Most of us will remember where we were when the tragedy of 9-11 unfolded. I was leaving Cambridge that day 
ending my time as a student here. Much has been written about the subsequent invasion of Afghanistan. The complexity of the wider context bears reflection and included years of campaigning for international action against the way women were treated under the Taliban, including, I remember as a student, early email campaigns received via the creaking Hermes system. But this takes us back to the nub of the problem. Even in a multinational and therefore multi-perspective coalition of over 40 countries, what are the limits of intervention and what responsibilities come with that? Only last week, 85 girls were blown up in Kabul and killed simply for going to school. We might be outraged at that, but they are dead. So the question again becomes, at whose cost and at what price? And crucially, who makes that choice? Girls' education is a high profile example, but probably not the best because the scale can in principle generate a tipping point. There are smaller marginalized groups where these decisions are on reflection less obvious. The danger of state-led international interventions is that individuals or communities believe you have more power than you do. Practitioners, be they working on behalf of states, the UN, NGOs can offer something, often simply an idea, a vision of a different way of living that individuals or communities desperately want, but as a practitioner, you do not pay their price when they miscalculate the limits of your power or the limits of the welcome they might receive through asylum. The final example isn't really mine to give. I was on a panel in Mongolia with three other female ambassadors. The aim was to set out and debate the, with, the with the audience policies our countries had at a national or legislative level to support women in the workplace. Questions focused on board level representation, gender pay gaps, positive discrimination, quotas in parliament, but eventually the discussion moved to maternity. The US ambassador noted to gasps of horror that there's no legal right to paid maternity leave in the US. The explanation she offered was to speak back to fundamental requirements to treat all employees equally. Of course, there are different ways to navigate maternity and equality in the workplace law, but many of the knottiest issues for women at work surround physical, cultural and personal experiences of family and how and for whom these should be translated into rights. To draw my reflections to a close, Winston Churchill said in World Crisis, out of intense complexities, intense simplicities emerge. In Lucy's book, she imagines a mosaic of feminisms through which I think patterns and pictures almost certainly resolve. But I also believe that leaders, whether politicians, activists, thinkers or practitioners need to take what I call conscious choices. That means that we must recognize that as these simplicities and patterns emerge, they are shadows that won't be shared by all. Every choice collapses complexity. So I would rather leave you with a quote from a poet than a statesman. But I being poor have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread upon my dreams. And that ultimately is why being a practitioner is a thankless task. It is far, far easier to have an idea, articulate an agenda, point out the failings, the perspectives missed, than it is to take choices that attempt to navigate the dreams of multiple individuals and groups in order to deliver something that might endure. But that is also why it is probably one of the most intellectually stimulating roles an active mind can have, and why it is of local and global importance that thoughtful, reflective people take up the pra practitioner's challenge. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to answer any questions or discuss any points with Lucy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Really appreciate that lovely engagement as a practitioner with history. And uh, the question, the Q&A box is open. So please do uh, feel free to, 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 uh, to respond there to either of our, um, our presentations. And maybe I'll just say, as people gather their thoughts for, uh, for questions, 
um, how interesting it is to talk about um, Islam and women's rights and veiling and you know these these themes that have just come up in both of our um, our thoughts on these matters. In fact, it was one of the the goals of my book was to draw out quite um, resolutely the you know the difficult questions that you um, that you also allude to there, Catherine, about um, the extent to which um, uh, feminist history needs to um, acknowledge the very active campaigns against some aspects of Islam that are experienced in some contexts as deeply constraining of women and women and girls, uh, but also the, the, the you know to to, to engage with and and, and stress that the the history of Islamic feminisms in their own right mm -hmm. and the way in which uh, veiling has in fact been a source of um, of, of power of uh, religious comfort, of practical comfort, um, and that we might want to take veiling out of its kind of exclusive Islamic realm and think about practices of head covering and veiling and face covering, which the, the, the pandemic has made us all too uh, aware are not only experienced in that, in that context. So um, I have a question here from, uh, from Lucy Pollard. Lucy, thank you. The question is, how can we begin to navigate the conflict between safe, safe spaces for women and the rights of trans women? Um, uh, you, you've gone straight to the heart of one of the kind of deepest areas of feminist controversy in the, in the present day. Um, Catherine, any thoughts on trans and, and how, as a diplomat, you, you might deal with those kinds of difficult questions? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it does speak to the heart of, a, of an active um, controversy in certain spaces. Um, I mean, practically, uh, you, you see in many organizations, this uh, begin, you know, the complexity of this discussion begins to, you know, to uh, collapse into issues, for example, around um, particular spaces such as the use or not of lavatories. Um, and certainly in many organizations that I've worked in, um, the practitioner response is to create optionality. And that, that often is in the practitioner's toolbox where you head, um, an option that works for those who wish um, to still use a space in the way that they might have grown up and, a, and the option to use a space which accommodates um, a diversity of um, identity within that space, within that workplace or that environment so that nobody feels excluded. And I think that's often, the goal as a practitioner is to actually find the best solution for the greatest number of people. And of course it means compromise. And of course it often means that um, at the ends of the spectrum, uh, people aren't satisfied, but usually there is a space in the middle where um, compromises from all sides can be made, um, often with increase in resource, such as, as having multiple different spaces so that these different perspectives can still be met. And obviously then over time, you tend to see that what might have been extraordinary in one era becomes completely normal in the next. And maybe we will go towards a place where, it, where nobody even questions um, who does and doesn't um, use communal facilities. Yeah. But I'd love to hear from a, from a, from a perspective, an historical um, and a live you know, realm of ideas. What is it that you, Lucy, often wish um, those of us who have to implement policies were thinking about when we were doing so? Well, that's that's a big question. Um, uh, I I would say just to kind of think about this trans issue historically as a good example of the kind of you know the, the awkward minefield that one has to has to tiptoe through as a, as a practitioner. Um, it's a question that really interests me because when I look back historically, it doesn't seem that new. So it's quite possible for us to imagine that, you know, feminists produced all these powerful, wonderful safe spaces for women, whether those are consciousness raising groups or um, Pandita Ramabai's um, uh, refuge or, or, or other kinds of uh, refuges across the world. And that kind of, you know, suddenly all, all this is challenged now by uh, individuals who are trans uh, identified or non-gender binary. But actually, when you look back, there is a much bigger history of non-gender binary individuals, uh, of trans individuals, uh, particularly if you look globally, actually, you know, there are some countries where that tradition is, is much more um, uh, culturally accepted and much more present, thinking about the Hijra in India. Uh, but it, it's also there in Anglo-American history. There's, there's, there's some wonderful recent work on female husbands by Jen Mannion. And um, 
understanding better how these are long-standing historical issues and there have been forms of integration and, and, and shared space um, in the past, I think gives us more hope for thinking that we can navigate that, that today. And you know, to start from a, um, a, a question of, of safeguarding, of keep, keeping people, people safe, which extends that safety to um, trans individuals as well as to, to women. And, and like Catherine, I, I, I do believe that it's possible to do that, particularly if we step back from what are sometimes quite polarizing imagined situations of invasion or destruction. Uh, in, in, in my experience as an academic who teaches lots of non-gender binary students, um, uh, we managed to navigate those, those, those situations perfectly adequately because there's great sensitivity and generosity on, on all sides. Mm. Okay, we, we, we have a, a bunch of other questions here. Um, uh, let's just have a quick look. Um, Newnham's role, uh, what should it be in helping young women understand the full context of feminism? Uh, should all graduands be encouraged to sign a feminist pledge promising to support other women and pay it forward? Um, well, it's a nice idea. Um, it definitely could never be compulsory. And we, you know, we simply can't assume that women's education fully aligns with a feminist identity. I think women's education is a right. Um, and um, uh, feminism is a complex terrain. As I said at the beginning, it's plural. I don't think a feminist manifesto could ever really capture the kind of the multiple uh, uses that we might have for feminism. So, and I'd, I'd certainly hesitate to, to make people uh, sign up for that. But, but having a debate is another matter. Paying it forward is a wonderful concept. Um, and uh, right now we are seeing a, a situation in which there is enormous feminist energy and interest amongst undergraduates. So we are having those debates all the time. Um, it, it's, I, it's an unprecedented period actually for um, a new generation of, of feminist activists who, who are very interested. Catherine, I'm going to um, pull out one of the questions for you here um, from Isabella, who asks um, uh, an example. Uh, could, could you give an example of when your assumptions or ideas about feminist success or achievements were most challenged, when a policy idea that seemed obviously positive in its contribution, but which turned out to be ultimately harmful, or when a, a, a historical account of feminist organizing was challenged by new historical work? Catherine, any sense there? Yes, gosh, those are those are really big questions, but thank you very much, Isabella. So I think that I'll give you one example. Um, or I'm going to speak in generalities, and I recognize that, you know, in part because that's that, that it saves time. Um, Mongolia is not um, what we might expect it would be. Um, and uh, Mongolian friends myself would describe the role of women as much closer to, to the role of women in um, Europe, probably sort of 40 or 50 years ago. And they will speak very powerfully to um, a tradition that comes from being um, nomadic, where if you imagine um, the, the snowstorm comes in, you need to mobilize all your resources in order to protect the livestock and have any chance of surviving that in temperatures that often go down to minus 40. So you cannot have um, half of your population wearing crinolines or otherwise encumbered and constrained by clothing or, or tradition. So there's always been a very, very strong role um, that women in Mongolian society have played. Um, and then, as Lucy has already touched on, the role um, of communism within um, the 20th century and the particular feminism that came through that also led, um, Mongolia always remained an independent country, but it was in the, um, the orbit of the USSR for 60 years, also led to a very strong role for women in the workplace. And therefore, at one level, the conversations that I was having as I set out in my talk were very similar to the ones that we have in this country. Um, you know, access to, to, to boards, um, you know, should our quotas a positive um, thing or a negative thing? Um, you know, how do you ensure um, you minimize the gender pay gap? But one of the things that became very obvious to me um, that I that I increasingly spoke about when I was in Mongolia was the effect um, that a strong societal focus on increasing the power and the role of women in all aspects of society was actually having on young men. And that what, what the data showed was that increasingly young men were opting out of education and were opting out 
um, of going to university and of taking up the roles that might traditionally have been them. Now, this is obviously a very, very complex area. And I'm not saying that because women were taking a more, uh, a more visible role in society that that had necessarily um, led to this male disempowerment. But what I found myself increasingly talking about, which I hadn't expected, was that if women um, wanted a fairer distribution um, of uh, the resources and the time um, available, which is one, but one way of looking at feminism, but one that was coming through very strongly, then possibly what um, needed to have more time and attention focused on was ensuring um, male attainment continued. Because what was increasingly happening was that women were the principal breadwinners, um, women were looking after the family, women were running the home, and women were basically doing everything, and men had less and less and less of a role. So actually, instead of there being equity, what was happening was an increased um, inequality. And so if you wanted to be a feminist, I think you actually needed um, a she for he campaign as much as you needed um, a he for she campaign. So that was something that, um, that surprised me. With policies gone wrong, I'm actually not going to give an example that I worked on, but I was thinking about it when Lucy and I were both touching on um, the, the, the different role that Islam can play around the world in this space, and also the question about trans issues. Um, for those of you who know a lot about Iran and a lot about Islam, what I'm about to say will not come as a surprise. But for those of you who don't, it may well be surprising to learn that certainly when I last looked at the figures, um, Iran has the second largest number of um, sex changes of any country in the world. And the Imam Khomeini in the 80s um, said that there was nothing in the Sharia that prohibited um, the change of sex um, of a man to a woman or a woman to a man. Now, on the one hand, that has been a cause of right celebration for many um, Shia Muslims around the world. And it's often pointed to um, as uh, an example of the pragmatism that the, the Shia jurisprudence um, allows for um, new debates and new reimaginings of what the world can be. The very negative side of this is that because um, of the wider societal and religious context in which the wider LGBTQ plus community finds themselves, a large number of those who have sex changes are actually probably would not self-identify um, as trans, they would self-identify as um, gay or lesbian and have had to change their sex in order to be with their partner. And so I think that is a very powerful example of how um, something that in one framework could be seen um, as very positive can have extremely negative consequences. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. I, I, we've got so many questions now. I want to try and uh, uh, bring some, some of the other uh, perspectives in. Um, Sinem asks about gender justice during pandemics, a, a, a topic that is absolutely on our minds and um, it perhaps shouldn't surprise us given the scale of uh, feminist mobilization in 2016, 2017, that when the pandemic came along uh, in 2020, there was, I think, a, an immediate scrutiny of what, what, what the differential impact there has been on, on men and women. And of course, you know, devastating findings about the rise of, of uh, domestic violence and so on. Um, but Sinem's asking about the earlier pandemic, Spanish flu, um, uh, Black Death. I can't, I'm not sure I can speak to the Black Death. I'm, I'm, I'm not enough of a, a, a medievalist. Um, but the Spanish flu is an interesting one because um, uh, it, I worked uh, uh, extensively on that, that period um, some years back now. And it was very sobering to note that the kind of life trajectories of about a third of my historical actors that I was focusing on simply came to an end. They, they, they passed away, they perished in that flu. And so the kind of the visible um, uh, footprint of the pandemic was very, very present. However, uh, um, very, very little policy debate about the, you know, the implication of the, of the pandemic. It, it simply got lost in the kind of um, uh, upheavals of 1918, 1919, the, the, um, the demobilization, the terrible um, economic instability that went with it and the movement of people around the world, um, uh, which so, so, so led to the, the, the deaths of the Spanish flu, meant that there wasn't really a policy debate about what had happened. 
um, I, I would say that the that, that women's role in nursing um, joined and, and helped cement the claims to citizenship and to the vote that were already there being made around, around women's war work. But I don't think there was a distinctive um, sense of, of who the, pan, the pandemic had, um, uh, had affected. So it's been very interesting to see that come out so strongly uh, in today. Uh, we have another question about um, pregnancy from Evan, pregnancy and giving birth and um, how reproductive realities, if you like, um, intersect with feminism. Um, and what we think that, that the future might be. Now, I'm very reluctant as a historian to make many uh, predictions about the future. So Catherine, um, maybe, maybe you might say a few words about reproductive rights and where they fit into your perspective as a, as a practitioner. Well, as ever, I'm going to say that it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I'm going to make an observation. I find it fascinating how societies around the world and understandably therefore women themselves often burden themselves with so much what I'm going to use religious language but I will call guilt um, around the process of giving birth and I'll give you an example of uh, which again goes back to Iran um, and a friend of mine who was um, from another European embassy who was due to give birth while she was there and she had every intention of doing so um, because the, the the standard of medical care in Iran is excellent um, and went to see her, her doctor and the doctor said, great, well, you're due around June, so shall we schedule you in at 9.30 on June the 14th? To which she said, what on earth do you mean? Because she hadn't realized that um, uh, the vast majority of uh, women in Iran who can afford to um, will actually have um, an elective cesarean. And that actually one of the consequences of this is that the sorts of hotels that her as hotels um, hospitals that her embassy would allow her to give birth in um, the number of natural births that their doctors have actually experienced is so few that in the end she judged she did actually need to go home to give birth. And I think this is really interesting because when we were unteasing with Iranian friends and with her, um, the difference here, one of the reasons why um, she felt she wanted to get uh, have a natural birth was because there was so much literature in her view um, around the potential negative consequences um, to the child perhaps or the women of a cesarean and therefore she felt the need um, to go uh, ahead with a natural birth if she could. Um, on the Iranian side, they could point to equal numbers of information, um, friends, relatives, um, online um, fora, which said that actually it was much better for the child to avoid some of the trauma of birth um, and to actually have a cesarean. But what came through very powerfully from both of them was this deep sense of guilt, this deep fear that if something went wrong, it would be their fault and they would need to live with that forever. Now, in there is a healthy sense of following guidance where guidance actually can be evidenced. But in there, I think, speaks to a very deep guilt that lives often within women, but which is placed on them by society. Everyone always has an opinion on what a woman should do when she gives birth um, or how she should bring up her children. And I'm sure this does um, stretch to people who aren't women, um, but it does feel as if in this space there are additional complexities beyond those which we would normally navigate because it is very hard to put the data towards a particular perspective and therefore what seems to be left is this lingering sense that whatever happens um, the woman will feel guilty. I mean when we look to the future there are as Lucy said you can look to the past for all sorts of futures there are many many different ways to parent. Um, we do have traditionally in the West, a very particular model. Um, but I mean, even within the West, if you look at different classes, um, even within the UK, between those who would have had wet nurses, the middle classes and the working classes, there have been very different models. And I do think that we can look back in order to explore um, different ways of parenting in the future. And I certainly have a lot of friends with children who wish that there was some more collectivized form of parenting um, after their experiences through the pandemic. Mm, thanks, Catherine. And actually looking back, we can see those moments. I mean, just to take a historical perspective, uh, we can see in the 19th century, both efforts to collectivize uh, childcare across a range of settings, but also the huge impact that women's decision 
uh, to not have children or to not get married. And sometimes that, that was a, a decision forced on them by demographic imbalances. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the debates in the late 19th century are turbocharged around gender by this controversial question of do, do women or don't women um, have the opportunity to have children? So we are, I guess, in another turbocharged uh, uh, moment where up to a third of um, uh, women in the kind of child rearing age group are choosing not to have children or not having the opportunity to have children. And that, that's, a, a, you know, that's a very global phenomenon. Um, leading to you know, really interesting debates about um, what, <laughs> what, what then will they do and what is the future of mothering and uh, how should fathers be uh, woven into that. Um, so, you know, watch this space, just like the, the late 19th century, I suspect it's going to be a very significant debate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have reached the end of our time, and I know there are lots of other questions that we didn't get to talk about. My apologies to those of you who, who, who gave us really interesting optics that we haven't been able to discuss. Um, I want to say a big thank you to the Centre for Gender Studies and the Centre for Geopolitical um, uh, Geopolitics for hosting us. It was really a, a, a total privilege to be able to discuss with with Catherine and, and, and to think about these issues with all of you. Uh, a, a big thank you to you, Catherine, for joining us as well and, and, and giving us your perspectives. It was a really fascinating uh, chance to go into dialogue. And um, do have a look um, at the podcast uh, if you want to, to, to follow anything up. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Lucy. And just to end by saying, do read Lucy's book if you haven't. It's, it's a very enjoyable read and informative. Thank you, Catherine.